Today, do you really need to worry about finding the no parallax point to capture panoramas? I'll address when you need to worry about it, along with some updated tips and tricks to capture better panoramas. Hey everyone, it's Hudson. Welcome to this week's Approach in the Scene. I wanna thank everyone who's been subscribing, liking, sharing the videos from this channel. Uh, it, it really makes a huge difference. And today's content is really based completely on questions that I've gotten either in the YouTube comments or people have emailed me or when they've signed up for the free office hours, which I'm gonna make a pitch for right now. We're gonna talk about handheld versus tripod photography uh, next Tuesday, 10 a.m. Pacific. You can sign up at hudsonherry.com slash office hours and leave your question there while you're signing up. Join just a free meeting of photographers either via Zoom or YouTube Live if you're Zoom, you're more interactive with us. Anyhow, I've had a lot of questions about panoramas and simple versus advanced panoramas. And do I really need to futz around with fighting the no parallax point? And do I need advanced panorama rails if I'm working with a tilt pan head or a fluid head? And I just thought I'd address some of that stuff as well as announce that I'm, I'm putting out a free PDF download for everyone who's using the Nikon Z cameras with the no parallax point measurements using my Kirk LRP3 adjustable nodal rail. Uh, I'm gonna tell you where that adjustable nodal rail is set and what the no parallax points are for my 14 to 30, 24 to 70, 70 to 200, uh, the 50 millimeter 1.8 and the 20 millimeter 1.8 that I frequently use. Those are the lenses that I would use for panos. I'll update it when I get the 14 to 24, but that's a free download linked in the video description. Uh, you're also gonna find in that video description a table of contents with each section of this video linked out. You can just click the time code and skip to or rewatch if you wanna rewatch it later. There's also a little scroll bar on the bottom of the YouTube video with those chapters delineated so you can kind of pick and choose. All right. So I guess the first thing I wanna talk about is, do I need to really worry about that no parallax point? You know, when does it become a problem? And that's really, really lens and scene dependent. If you're out working with a big, beautiful vista where everything's out at a great distance from you, and you're working with a normal or wide angle lens, you really don't have to worry very much. I frequently find myself, you know, on the riverbank looking at the city across the river here in my hometown, and I'll just, pick up my camera handheld and be really careful to overlap my, my images sufficiently. I usually activate the rule of grid, third grids. This is all in my advanced panel course, which is linked in the video description. But you know, I'll make sure I get about a 66% overlap. I wanna be using the center sweet part of that image where the lens is performing at its best from each frame. And also if there's an image that goes bad, I can junk one and still have plenty of overlap. So I'll overlap, handhold, watch that my level's good, what becomes a problem is if you've got something that causes you to differentially focus or really ratchet down aperture because you've got a close subject and a distant subject and you're trying to keep those both in focus. That's gonna cause a problem where you get parallax where the close and distant subjects appear to move in relation to each other in the frame. And so, you know, that's gonna be something that you're gonna to have to experiment a little bit with. Whenever it's a question to me and the scene's important, I jump back over that no parallax point. It's as simple as that. So again, the longer the lens and the closer the subject that you're working with, the more of a problem it's gonna be. And the more that you do these panoramas, the more you're gonna realize, you know, what software you're using, what lens you're using, how close a subject is gonna be a problem. My suggestion is to just have a nodal slider with you and that way you can get over the no parallax point whenever you're in doubt. I certainly try to always do it if I'm working with my 70 to 200 because often there's something that's closer than, you know, than infinity in the scene when I'm working with a longer lens like that. There's a really interrelated question that I get quite a bit, which is, you know, I've got your pan and tilt ultimate lightweight Acrotec head or I've got your Manfrotto fluid head and you know, do I really need to have that whole rail assembly that comes out to the side with the vertical rail and then you know, move the camera out to do multi-row panoramas? And the answer is the same. You know, it, if you're using this head, it pans level, it tilts level. So if you wanna capture a panorama and say, you know, snap, 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 tilt, snap, 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 and shoot a whole you know, grid of images, 
however many you want to capture a panorama in multiple rows, it'll work fine as long as you don't have super close and super distant objects. And some people say, well, you know, why would it matter if I'm over the no parallax point with my slider? And the reason that it matters is that as this tilts, it moves that measurement, it moves that nodal point forward or it moves that nodal point backwards from the actual you know, nodal point, the no parallax point. See, I even catch myself saying it wrong. So if, if you're set up level, you might be dead over the, the no parallax point. Great for a panning panorama. But if you tilt way forward, all of a sudden, that may no longer be the true no parallax point. Yes, you're panning level tilted, but it's still forward of the actual no parallax point. So that's the problem that you encounter and the reason why you want to get uh, the advanced tools that I talk about in my advanced panorama course for multi-row panoramas. It's just a simple dovetail that sticks out to the side, a dovetail that rises up with a panning clamp on that and then you put your no parallax slider in that upper vertical panning clamp. That's all kind of detailed in the advanced panorama course that's linked in your video description. So I guess the, the, you know, the idea is if you're doing multi-row panoramas, it's much easier to do on a pan and tilt head. If you don't have any close subjects, you don't need to worry about the whole advanced setup. I frequently do multi-row panos and get away with it, uh, even if there's somewhat close subject. If it gets to have a really close subject, like that situation I talked about up on an escarpment, and you want the edge of the mountain that you're standing on to be in the frame, ultra wide angle lens, and you wanna sweep through, you're tilted way down. I often set up the advanced system with the, with the extra rails, just so that I make sure that I'm over that no parallax point because the edge of the mountain is so close to me. All right, um, so moving on, I, you know, I'm excited to talk about the fact, oh, one more thing. Here's another real interesting pano question that I get a lot. People watch my no parallax point, finding the no parallax point video, the free download that's in the video description. And then they tell me, well, how do I do that? You know, I'm, I'm working with a long lens and I can't even get focused on the, on the light stand that I have in the foreground. You can see I'm set up right now to, to do these measurements of my Z cameras with all my lenses and just make sure I have them dialed for that free download document I told you about at the start of the video. Uh, and if I'm working with a 50 millimeter lens, I have that, that uh, light stand out here set up just about the right distance between myself and the cedar tree that's behind it. So I've got, you know, I'm in my backyard, I've got the fence, I've got the cedar tree, I've got the light stand in between us. I'm gonna change the distance between that light stand and my camera. If I'm working with an ultra wide angle like the 14 to 30, I'm probably gonna grab that light stand and I'm gonna bring it right up close in front of my camera because that's as close as the subject might be. It might be just a few feet away from my lens that I wanna get focused in. Uh, so when I'm working with a 70 to 200 millimeter lens, I'm gonna move the camera way back. I'm gonna move the light stand forward and still have something out of infinity to focus on. So, you know, to have in the background that's got vertical elements to it, like the porch posts on my home back there, or the cedar trees, or that fence, the, the, the aluminum fence back there with the vertical black rails. I want something that I can see if that, pole, that, that light stand is shifting in relation to the objects in the distant background that are vertical. Um, but I am going to be moving my position. You know, think about if you were photographing a scene and you wanted a panorama with a 70 to 200 millimeter lens, you're not likely to have someone standing as close as I am to the camera right now. It's going to be a more distant subject. Maybe there, maybe there are things that are 10, 15, 20 feet away from your camera that you'd have to focus in to get sharp and still have the background sharp. So you're maybe going to stop down to f11 or f16 to get the infinity of the scene looking relatively sharp while you focus on that close foreground subject and then swivel the camera. So you need to put your light stand where you would actually be working with a subject given the lens that you're working with. Ultra wide angle lens, very close. Long lens, further away, but still have a distant subject that would be out at infinity. And then the same thing's true, you know, 50 millimeter lens, I'm kind of in the middle, like I'm showcasing right now. So. Those are some tips that I would throw at you that I've gotten as questions after people have watched my advanced panorama course or the, 
the, uh, the no parallax, how to find the no parallax point video. So jump in, if you're a Z camera owner, grab that download, it's just a PDF that you can take with you on your mobile device or print and stick in your pocket that's got all the measurements using the Kirk LRP3, uh, no parallax adjustable rail. I've had a few people ask about why do you want an adjustable rail? Well, now with the mirrorless cameras and the short flange distance, sometimes you use a wide angle lens that's really small and the rail will actually get in the frame. So this lets you adjust to different measurable points along the rail where your camera is mounted on it. For a shorter lens, you'd move forward. For a longer lens, you'd move back and then do your calibration. So this sheet that I have will tell you what point I'm at on my LRP3 and then what the measurement to the center of my clamp is. And it should be universal for the Z6 and Z7 with the lenses that I'm calibrating it. You can download that for free. There's a link in the video description. So thanks so much to everybody who's watching. I hope that this spurs uh, some, more, <laughs> some more debate and discussion. I know there were a lot of people who wanted to sign up for the Panorama project and I really limited it to two groups of 10. I don't wanna have too many people at once. I wanna be able to have a really, uh, you know, kind of a, an intimate learning experience for all the people that are involved in this where we're watching e what each other have to say and critiquing and communicating with each other like that kind of workshop bond that forms and I find that more than 10 people doesn't work out. So we've had a lot of interest. If you're interested in taking part in one of these intensive projects during this, this time of the pandemic where I can't be uh, feeling safe about taking people out into wild places and beautiful country and doing workshops that I love out in the wild with groups, um, then, you know, jump on. I've got that website, hudsonharry.com slash projects, and there's a link in the video description. Uh, jump on there and sign up for the waiting list. There's, or what topics you want to see. We've got some future topics highlighted there and kind of a survey of what you want the most. We'll be doing more projects coming into the winter and fall here. Uh, and we might rerun the Pano project if we've got enough demand. There's a number of people who've signed up on the waiting list. All right, so thanks so much, everybody. I really hope to see you in the office hours this coming Tuesday, handheld versus tripod photography. There's a link again. All these links are in the video description. Thanks everybody for watching. I hope that you're all having some fun, finding some, some ways to run through these crazy times and do some photography. You know, I have a recommendation for everyone and I hope that no matter what side of the political divide you're on, uh, you, you'll take me up on this. There's an amazing YouTube released film that Patagonia sponsored that's produced by Yvonne Chouinard and Robert Redford on public lands. People will ask me, why am I wearing this public lands now shirt? And it's because as a, as a young person, I grew up fishing and climbing and backpacking and camping in the public lands of the West. And they're really near and dear to my heart. And they're something that I've been enjoying sharing with my children. And I really want to be able to, sh to have them share them with their children and that movie is amazing and eye-opening for those who aren't following a lot of the privatization that's been happening uh, in, in the best of our public lands. So, not to bring too much politics into it, but I hope you'll go check that movie out. It's well worth watching. I, my whole family watched it. My kids were engaged by it. The scenery is beautiful. The photography is beautiful. It's filmed in a lot of places that I've spent a great deal of time like Anwar and Bears Ears and then there's a whole bunch in the Boundary Waters and just a lot of beautiful places around this country. So I hope you check it out and enjoy it. Thanks so much everybody, stay safe and we'll see you next week.